listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. Good morning. For those of you who were not here yesterday, I would like to introduce not only the week, but also our speaker for the week. It was in 1926 that uh, Dallas Seminary established the W.H. Griffith Thomas Memorial Lectureship in honor of William Henry Griffith Thomas, one of the founding fathers of Dallas Seminary. Over the years, the academic departments have taken terms in inviting prominent scholars to deliver these lectures that are designed to be a scholarly treatment of significant issues in their field of study, as well as their vocational experience. One purpose of the lectureship is to provide the seminary community with exposure to a variety of scholars from different theological perspectives within uh, evangelical Christianity. This year, the Biblical Counseling Department has invited Dr. Everett Worthington as our guest lecturer for the week. His series of lectures is entitled Christian Psychology, Virtue, and the Virtues. Dr. Worthington is professor of psychology at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia. He's also a licensed clinical psychologist. He's published over 30 books, over 300 articles and scholarly chapters, mostly on forgiveness, marriage, and family topics. In the last 10 years, Dr. Worthington has studied how forgiveness and justice work together and how they also can seemingly oppose one another. Dr. Worthington has worked with several governments around the world promoting forgiveness, reconciliation, and given his lifelong work in the secular state university and his Christian beliefs, he considers himself a bridge builder between Christian, secular, academic, and lay research and practice communities. He considers his mission to be doing all he can to bring forgiveness into every willing heart, home, and homeland. He enjoys tennis and ballroom dancing. He and his wife, Kirby, a child development and parenting specialist, have four adult children who are scattered around the world. It was a privilege to spend some extended time with him yesterday at a lunch and uh, to hear of his uh, solid witness uh, on a secular university campus for the cause of Christ, but still within the skills of his expertise as a psychologist. Uh, Dr. Worthington, we're grateful to have you on our campus. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Everett Worthington again this morning? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Bailey. I would like to encourage you to harass Gary Barnes to get the script that he talked last night. It is really an excellent and balanced presentation and uh, deserves to be widely read. I saw everybody perk up when he said ballroom dancing. <laughs> it's the secret pleasures, isn't it? <laughs> so today I want to talk about four Christian virtues uh, from a psychologist's point of view which is going to show that psychologists really can have fun, actually. In yesterday's talk, I outlined a psychological model of virtue. I identified continual pressures of internal and external factors that impinge on us, and we seek to weight the virtues within our hierarchy of virtues so that we can choose the right one at the right time. We rely on the leading of the Holy Spirit for those choices, but we still must make the choices during times of testing as well as times of peace. Today, we look at some of the ways that psychological researchers, particularly our team of Christian psychologists at VCU, have uh, studied four of the virtues, justice, mercy, forgiveness, and humility, and rather than load you down with methods and findings and statistics. I know that's a disappointment. Uh, I merely want to show some of the ways that psychological scientists can study virtues, and in the end, I'll conclude that the virtues are intimately glued together. So first, justice. Justice is interpersonal and societal and social. People have a, an innate sense of justice inside, as we might expect, because we bear the image of a just God. Neuroeconomist Ernst Fair of Switzerland has shown through using game theory that justice is hardwired into people. 
When people are taken advantage of in the laboratory, they might choose to pay the other person back by making him or her suffer. And just as they make that decision, Ernst Fehr finds that people's pleasure pathways light up in their brain. These are the same pleasure pathways that light up when we look at that death by chocolate dessert in front of us and we go, I shouldn't eat that, but I'm going to. We are hardwired for justice. Justice is social. My colleague, Rebecca Kiefer, and I created a restorative justice experiment <clears throat> uh, in which we randomly assigned two 18-year-old males to portray either an offender who had stolen a car or his victim. We had two 23-year or older women play their mothers. Well, it was a stretch, but, you know, it's the best we could do with college folks. <clears throat> According to the scenario, the offender had been convicted of the crime, but the judge had mandated family mediation. If the families could agree, the judge would assign their recommendation as the sentence. If no agreement, then the judge would impose a punitive sentence. A trained restorative justice facilitator conducted each family mediation meeting. Now, we pulled people aside, the, the offender aside, privately and told that man that either he could absolutely not apologize nor offer any restitution during the meeting that was going to come, or that he must apologize and offer restitution. We then engaged them in a restorative justice meeting, and they role-played their, their role. Unless you think that this role-playing wasn't very lifelike, two of the eight guys who were assigned to apologize actually cried as these role-play meetings took place. After the meeting, we found that a sense of justice was, uh, of injustice was lessened and mercy and forgiveness were increased when the offender apologized and offered to make restitution relative to when they didn't. Justice is social and societal, but people internally perceive a sense of injustice, which we call the injustice gap. This is the gap between the way that a, an offender would like to see a situation resolved and the way that the offender currently perceives the situation. Now, as a person apologizes and makes restitution, you can see that that injustice gap is narrowed because justice is being introduced into the system. Charlotte Whitvliet at Hope College and her colleagues studied this injustice gap in three experiments. <clears throat> when people who imagined that they had been robbed received an apology and some restitution, those people reduced the injustice gap and the amount of unforgiveness that they experienced. Strong apologies, which we call groveling, were as effective as getting everything back that was taken from you plus $50 in reducing the amount of unforgiveness. Weak apologies basically had no effect. In fact, they made some people mad. <clears throat> Forgiveness is internal, but justice is social. Joanne Sang at Baylor and her colleagues created a game to study actual unjust offenses that occurred in the lab. People who got apologies and received restitution were actually more willing to act in merciful ways that indicated that they had internal transformations. Now, you can see from our experiments on justice that people make an internal accounting of the degree of injustice that they are feeling after such reparative strategies as apology and restitution, these amounts of injustice are lessened. So people 
not only act on their internal perception, but we also found that when we measured their physiological responses, their bodies went right along with their perception. Well, this is what we might expect with people who bear God's image. Psychology allows us to support through observation what we are told in Scripture. But psychology does other things too. We have experimental ways of asking questions now that have not been addressed in Scripture alone. We might find, for example, what kind of apologies are good ones, what kind aren't good ones, how wimpy can you be, how groveling must you be, under what conditions might a person not accept an apology. We can, in short, ask a lot of how questions that we could only speculate about before. Our second virtue is mercy. So let's turn now to mercy. We began to study mercy in 2009 after I reviewed psychological studies on mercy, and I came up with a goose egg. There were zero psychological studies on mercy. This is what every psychologist dreams of a well-talked-about topic that nobody's ever studied before. My colleague Aubrey Gartner and I studied mercy in her dissertation and subsequent research. Now, we defined mercy as an act by someone who has the power and authority to do so to administer or recommend less punishment than a wrongdoer deserves. People who might have the authority or power to act mercifully, include judges, jury members, parole boards, parents of, say, disobedient children, employers, or supervisors who uncover mistakes or moral wrongdoing, and, in fact, any person who is wronged by another person. Mercy is social, societal. It must be an act. Mercy doesn't happen inside us. Merciful thoughts, merciful motives, merciful emotions happen inside of us, but mercy is an act. We developed a questionnaire to measure mercy, which we call the mercy meter. Okay, we're technical. Don't try this at home, (laughs) all right? Strictly speaking, though, mercy meter doesn't measure mercy. It assesses self-reports of mercy. To measure actual mercy as a behavior, we drew on a variation of Milgram's obedience experiments. Yeah, I see people perking up. Uh, No, but it did not involve shocks. Like Milgram, though, we did deceive our participants. We recruited women student participants at VCU who wanted to make amends for some kind of wrong for which they couldn't forgive themselves. We told them that we were collaborating with two other universities and were linked in a video connection through Skype. Uh, And this study was about how women might deal with self-condemnation by publicly making amends for the wrong. So each woman began by writing a description of some terrible wrong that she felt self-condemnation for and couldn't forgive herself for. We then said that one of the three women would be chosen at random by the computer to read her account on video. She would then make amends for her wrongdoing by holding a heavy book in her outstretched hand for some length of time. We said, well, in pilot testing, we said, uh, you know, most of the people can really only hold this for no more than two minutes maximum. The computer would determine which woman would be the judge who would recommend the duration of the, the other woman's public suffering. The computer would also assi- uh, assign which woman would be a parole officer who watches the suffering and could stop it earlier than the judge had assigned if she wished. This parole officer, which the computer selected, was always the woman from VCU. She was 
actually the only true participant, the amends maker and the judge were actors in professional training at VCU's drama department <laughs> who were filmed ahead of time and shown on the video screen as a split screen and thus we were all on Skype together, but they weren't really linked by Skype. <clears throat> The amends meter, a maker read her account of talking uh, a friend into going to a party of strangers and, and then selfishly abandoning her there and leaving her to make her own way home. The judge was allowed to assign between one and three minutes of holding the book out, although, as I said, two minutes was said to be about all that anybody could really tolerate. The judge a regular hanging judge, one of our confederates, went for the maximum three minutes. She obviously had issues. <clears throat> the VCU participant as parole officer was thus, by our definition, in the position to offer mercy. The men's maker then went through three minutes of holding the book. She grunted, complained that it was heavy, whined. Later she said her arm was hurting, made increasingly distressed comments, and finally, after two and a half minutes, if this person still had not ended the, the, the parole officer had not ended the study, she looked directly at the camera and said, you have the power to end this, please stop it. The time the participant, this is what psychologists call having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> the time the participant allowed the suffering to go on was a measure of mercy. We experimentally manipulated the degree of group similarity by regional dialect. So, you know, the degree of uh, similarity is like we had the North Carolina woman, ostensibly North Carolina, say, y'all. You know, a lot, although they did not do the Texas thing of all oh, you all, <laughs> you know. And then we had a Canadian woman who was different, eh? Uh, and so by manipulating the way they talked, we tried to make them seem more or less similar to the Virginia participants. Mercy was indeed related to in-group similarity, uh, more mercy to people who were more like them, to empathy for the person suffering and to scores on the mercy meter to their self-reports of feeling mercy. Okay, our third virtue, forgiveness. Now I've actually already talked about forgiveness throughout so far in looking at justice and, and some mercy, but uh, <clears throat> let's summarize some of the things that I just kind of dropped casually into our studies of mercy, uh, of justice and mercy. And, um, you know, we've got like hundreds of studies to back these things up. So, <clears throat> just some points about forgiveness. One, the size of the injustice gap is related to, pe to how forgiving people feel toward the offender. Big injustice gaps, hard to forgive. Little injustice gaps, easy to forgive. Big injustice gaps produce higher amounts of emotional unforgiveness. It's a big gap, people are riled up. Little gap, not so much. Unforgiveness is a jumble of negative, unforgiving emotions, resentment, bitterness, hatred, hostility, anger, and fear. There are two types of forgiveness, actually, and these two types are different from each other. They're not two halves of forgiveness. They're two different parts. One we call decisional forgiveness, the other emotional forgiveness. God, I believe, requires decisional forgiveness, as we see in Matthew 6, 12, 14, and 15. Decisional forgiveness is not about changing our emotions but about sincerely saying that regardless of how I feel toward you who have hurt me, I won't seek vengeance and I will treat this person as a valuable person in Christian love. It's a behavioral intention statement. It's how I intend to behave. <clears throat> 
people can make and stand by a decision to forgive without being emotionally at peace with the wrongdoer. So that suggests that there must be a second type of forgiveness that deals with this emotional upsetness or peace, and we call this emotional forgiveness. That involves replacing those negative, unforgiving emotions, resentment, bitterness, hostility, hatred, anger, fear, with positive, other-oriented emotions, such as empathy for the person who hurt me, sympathy, compassion, or even love. Now, tomorrow, I am going to talk about how we can help people experience decisional forgiveness and emotional forgiveness toward people who have uh, hurt them, and also the next day, how to forgive ourselves. A fifth point, forgiveness is internal. Forgiveness happens inside my skin. It is not the same thing as telling a person, I forgive you. Because after all, couldn't I say, I forgive you, in order to just throw you off, and when you turn your back, I stab you in your back. Saying I forgive you is not the same thing as actually forgiving. Forgiving takes place inside our skin. Forgiveness, which is internal uh, and uh, uh, differs, uh, it differs from reconciliation. So reconciliation is something that ha happens between people. Forgiveness happens within. Reconciliation between Reconciliation is restoration of trust in a relationship where trust has been violated. Reconciliation requires that both people be trustworthy. And so God doesn't make reconciliation mandatory like God makes forgiveness mandatory. Because if that were the case, someone who hated me could hold me hostage by never allowing us to reconcile. Paul says that as much as it is up to us, live in peace with all people. It isn't always up to us. In 1984, theologian Lewis Smedes published Forgive and Forget, Healing the Hurts You Don't Deserve. And he initiated the secular study of forgiveness by suggesting that forgiveness, forgiving was good for us. That is, he argued that to forgive someone was good self-therapy. The theologian Greg Jones at Duke in the book Embodying Forgiveness decried the focus on self-interest and suggested instead the traditional Christian motives of forgiving because God forgave us in Christ and forgiving because Forgiveness was embodied. It was part of the life of the body of Christ. Smead's claim stuck a harmonic chord with secular psychotherapists and researchers, though, and that started the secular study of forgiveness. Among the many studies of forgiveness that ensued, we found that self-interested forgiving produces small, positive, and lasting forgiveness appealing to someone to forgive because it's good for you. Why are you carrying this around? Why are you making yourself suffer? The other person doesn't even know that you're holding a grudge. You're just making yourself miserable. That produces a small, lasting forgiveness. But forgiving to bless the other person, while it takes a longer time to ramp up, eventually produces much more forgiveness, and it gets stronger with the more time that you spend trying to forgive. We might yield a, this might yield a lesson about appealing to people for their salvation based on self-interested motives. If people do not deepen the concern, uh, do not deepen the concerns of being Christian to loving God above all and loving our neighbor as much as or more than they love themselves, then they may end up with a anemic faith, genuine but limited. Our fourth virtue, humility. 
Self-centeredness is a natural condition of the fallen person. Although appeals to self-interest can move us in positive ways, we need more than self-interest to function optimally in the kingdom of God. Enter humility. So psychological scientists measure things. But measuring humility is problematic. I'm sure you can see this. Imagine a humility scale with questions like this. How humble are you? Zero equals none. Ten equals the most humble person in existence. <laughs> well, there's an obvious problem. What do you do with a person who says nine? I'm nine. I'm, you know, practically the most humble person that I know. And then, you know, in your spare time, ponder Moses. The Scripture says he is the most humble of all men. It says that in Deuteronomy that Moses wrote. <laughs> it kind of breaks your mind, doesn't it? But Scripture's authoritative. We you can trust that. So that's a case where the self-report actually is genuine. <clears throat> Measuring humility is a challenge. We found the most success is, well, I wrote a book called uh, Humility, the Quiet Virtue. It's about other people. You go, well, usually that gets a laugh, but, you know, I guess you don't understand my, and anyway, <clears throat> the fallen nature, but... Um, <clears throat> Actually, the, the best way we found to measure humility is by asking other people to rate someone on humility. From a relational pers uh, and furthermore, we measure humility within specific relationships, not as a personality trait. The way that you're humble with your boss is different than with your spouse or with your friends. From a relational perspective, we define relational humility as a relationship-specific judgment that a person is other-oriented rather than self-focused, marked by the ability to regulate self-oriented emotions such as pride and accomplishments and inhibit socially off-putting expressions of those emotions has an accurate view of oneself and one's abilities, and has a modest style of self-presentation. Accordingly, relational humility is measured by asking someone who is in an actual relationship with a person to rate that person's humility. Various relationship factors such as characteristics of the uh, judge, the target, the relationship, and the information available may affect one's judgment of the target person's humility. What we found in our studies of humility is uh, what Archbishop of Canterbury, former Archbishop of Canterbury, William Temple uh, said. We found that he's right in saying, and it's a quote, humility does not mean thinking less of yourself than of other people nor does it mean having a low opinion of your own gifts. It means freedom from thinking of yourself at all. Restorative justice thinks about restoring the offender, not getting vengeance. Mercy thinks of acting empathically to alleviate suffering. Forgiveness is best brought about by altruistic rather than self-interested forgiveness. William Temple's humility is vital. It looks to the other more than it looks to the self. Humility is about thinking of others, having an accurate view of oneself, and presenting oneself modestly. It is, in short, a virtue. And as a virtue, it is an illustration of eudaimonia, trying to promote good for self and others. It's formed in character as a habit requiring diligent and persistent practice over long periods of time. It is then subject to life's test and emerges upon challenge. These four virtues, justice, mercy, forgiveness, and humility, often come together. The thread weaving them into a single cloth is humility. First, Jesus' humility from which all humility takes its cue, 
and in the derivative humility of others. We Christians should be at the forefront of exhibiting the virtues and also helping others to do so. And humility is the glue that holds the virtues together and should characterize us as virtuous. Are we virtuous? Thank you.